Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a two to four minute little review on each one to give you guys an idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell you anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. Okay, remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting off with our number one spot, I have an SDS Imports TSIS manufactured 1911A1. Now, this is designed to closely mimic the 1911A1 used by the United States in World War II and beyond Korea, Vietnam, until it would be replaced by the M9 in the 1980s. Now, like the original, this is a 45 ACP feeding from a seven round detachable box magazine. It does have a military parkerized, this grayish greenish finish, which would be correct for the original, and the Keys Firebrite type brown plastic or resin grip panels. Um, I have an original World War II Ithaca 1911, made I think in 1942, 1942-1943, uh, and it very, very closely, uh, this closely resembles that. And from, from about 15 feet away, you would not be able to tell that this is a replica. So they did a good job. Um, TSIS is a manufacturer based in Turkey. They were founded in 1993, so they have not been around for a very long time uh, as far as arms manufacturing goes, but they are known for making really good, uh, inexpensive and affordable firearms. Uh, this included, so imported by SDS, of course, uh, these would typically have a retail price point brand new between about four and five hundred dollars. That's where we're seeing the used ones go about right now between about four to five hundred dollars. Of course, the market's a little bit crazy. Uh, being true to its original form, an A1 differs from a standard 1911 by features like a swelled mainspring housing back here. You have a flatter trigger face. The standard 1911 trigger is just a little bit longer. It sticks out probably about halfway across the, uh, the frame and the trigger guard. You have these little scallops on the side of the frame. That's a quick indication as well. But it was just basically a simply modified and revised, less expensive to manufacture version of the 1911 that was issued during World War I. Typically, the World War I uh, firearms also have a blued finish. Again, World War II, they would go to this cheaply applied and very durable parkerizing type finish. Now, the World War II 1911s would be made by Ithaca, as mentioned, Remington Rand, which made the most Colt, Singer, and Union Switch and Signal. Uh, Singer, Union Switch and Signal made by far the fewest, and then Remington Rand made the most. Um, even though a Remington Rand, uh, they were produced uh, in very large numbers, and again, the most common that you'll find, but even those, which would be the least collectible of all the manufacturers, are going to start you for, for a correct, authentic one around $1,000. Uh, maybe a hair less if you've got like an Arsenal refurb or something like that, but you're going to pay about $1,000, and the price for a standard 1911A1 from World War II will go quickly up from there, up to two, three thousand dollars is typical on an Ithaca or a Colt, and then up to, you know, five thousand dollars for a Union Switch and Signal and well beyond that for a Singer. So um, this is a good way that if you want to put together a World War II collection and you don't want to pay the high prices on an authentic collectible gun, maybe you want something that's a good representation and something you can enjoy at the range and not worry about, you know, wearing out a piece of history. These are a great option, again, at about what you're gonna pay for a Rock Island 1911. They're functional, they're cool pistols that really give you that authentic look and feel of a you know World War II 1911 for a fraction of the price. So really, really cool to get these in. I've had a few of them in new and used, and they always attract a lot of buyers. So there you are, a TSIS uh, SDS Imports 1911A1. Okay, up next I have a product from Stoger. This is the M3K three-gun competition shotgun. Of course, by Stoger. Now, this is a 12-gauge, semi-automatic, inertia-driven shotgun. Um, as many people may know, Stoger is a subsidiary, a subsidiary of Benelli, and what makes Benelli semi-auto shotguns so popular is that same inertia system, which, of course, you're going to find here on this as well. Now, the M3K is built off of the Stoger M3000 line with some updates and some renovation, uh, renovations excuse me, that have made it more appealing for the three-gun, sort of off-the-shelf, three-gun competition shotgun, the one you can take right out of the box and go right to the competitions with. Now, this does have one additional feature. The previous owner did add a magazine tube extension. The traditional shotgun, I believe, comes with a four or five round magazine tube. 
Uh, so really, really nice shotguns. One other thing that makes these so popular is the price point. Brand new, right now, when you can find them, you should be around the $700 mark. I am seeing them used for selling around a similar price point as long as it's in the original box in really good condition. Like this one is does have its original box. Um, not much else to say about it. Just a really, really smooth, tight action. Uh, the blue components are actually factory stock on it. Um, just a really, really cool shotgun. So to be able to get out, and, get out and, and compete at a very low price point with things like Benelli's, Berettas, other things you're gonna find out there at, you know, that might be well over $1,000 to $1,500. For the money, this is a really cool, lightweight, um, alloy receiver, polymer four end, uh, ventilated rib, fiber optic front sight. Uh, you have a pad here on the butt stock. So it's, I mean, really everything you need to get into competition shooting at that price point again. Uh, I have not had one of these in here, but I have heard of them and seen them before. A uh, really cool popular shotgun put out by Stoker or Benelli. Okay, up next, I have a really cool rifle from CZ. This is the CZ model 455. Uh, this one here is cham chambered in 22 Magnum. They would also chamber them in 22 Long Rifle and 17 HMR. Now the 455 would come out in 2010 as a replacement to the 452. The 452 came out in the 1950s. So the 450 series of bolt action rifles has actually been around for quite some time. Now the 455 was discontinued recently in 2018 in replacement for uh, the 457 line. Now, what the concept was here on the 455 was to take the 452 and bring it into the modern era of manufacturing. Uh, they would tighten in the tolerances. The barrel was a hammer forged hand lapped barrel. The trigger was adjustable. Um, the, the really cool thing or the claim to fame on the 455 was the quick change barrel system. So the barrel is actually held in place by two set screws, which you can remove and switch out for a different profile barrel or a different caliber. Now the 455, much like what SIG does with all their products, they offer the 455 in a huge amount of different SKUs, whether you wanted the standard, the Varmint, the Match, the Super Match, the Lux, the Lux 2, um, the FS, which this is with a full length, beautiful man liquor style uh, stock. I love this look, the man liquor stock with the high comb. You could get the basic uh, sporting stock configuration, wood or polymer, blued or stainless finish, different barrel lengths, again, different barrel profiles. And they come at a huge uh, variety in price points to have a good selection for the consumer and what type of market they wanna be into, a nicer looking classic rifle like this, uh, for maybe competition or sport shooting or a polymer stock, uh, less expensive uh, entry level, the base model that you could take out on the farm and throw around, shoot 10 cans with, let the kids take out, you know, go hunting with whatever. Um, the 455 was just sort of a rifle that would fit into everybody's budget and everybody's need, which was a, made it a really popular and really cool rifle. And the 457 is still that way today. The variety of different offerings in the product line are huge. Um, 455, really not much else to say about it. Really, really cool rifles. They they go anywhere price point wise. Um, the four to $700 price point is typically about where you are on these based on which model and variation you're gonna get. And again, they made like 15 different variations of the 455 in different calibers. So uh, like I said, this one here is a 22 Magnum. The LS with the, I'm sorry, the FS with the uh, man looker stock on it. Just a beautiful overall rifle. Really cool to get this one in. All right, up next is a personal favorite of mine, the M1 Carbine. And I say carbine, not carbine. It's a derivative of the French word carabine. And so that's the word I'm gonna use, but anyway, you're free to pronounce it however you like before I get all the corrections. But uh, moving into this, the story here would really begin in 1937 with the US adopting the M1 Garand rifle. Now, John C. Guerin, the designer of the rifle, worked closely with Springfield Armory when that was put into adoption and later into service. Now, by 1938, we had many of the M1 Garand rifles entering service and being issued to rear echelon troops, which would quickly complain that it was too cumbersome and heavy and got in the way of their daily tasks, whether they were vehicle drivers, cooks, mechanics, clerks. They didn't have a main job of lugging around and shooting a rifle. They needed something easier to carry around and also practical to defend themselves with. Now, back in World War I, it was just typically the 1911 sidearm. And handguns are typically good sidearms for rear echelon people. However, in the late 1930s, uh, here in the United States, we're noticing that you know Germany is declaring war on everybody. They're invading Poland. They're using their blitzkrieg tactics, and they're very routinely getting behind enemy lines, whether it's through rush tactics or airborne drops or anything like that. So the United States decided they needed something that was more viable as a rear echelon, not only a a personal defense weapon, but something that can be used as a viable combat weapon. 
in the event that the rear line becomes the front line. So they came up with the concept of needing a carbine like the M1 carbine. Now this was in 1938, they would put out a request for a, a set of standards that they would want on the rifle, which was completed in 1940, and the trials would then open to different arms manufacturers submitting different patterns uh, for trial. Now, at the time, Winchester was actually actively working on a revised version of the M1 service rifle, and they had really no interest in participating in this program until the leader, uh, John um, uh, John Browning, not, not the John Browning, uh, but his brother, John Browning, uh, would pass away. Uh, Winchester would then go on to look at incorporating some sort of design elements for an M1 carbine. Now, at the time, there was a gentleman by the name of David Williams who was serving a time in the North Carolina Corrections System. And during that time, he had come up with the development of the short stroke gas piston. Now, remember the M1 Garand used a long stroke gas piston, which is hard to get that operating system into a short, small, and lightweight package like the M1 carbine. The short stroke gas piston was a perfect uh, candidate for this new carbine system. So they brought him on board at Winchester after his time in prison was over and they would get to work on the M1 carbine. Of course, they would come up with a couple design iterations until it was finally awarded its contract and adopted for service and then would then go into production and issued to American troops in 1941 until the end of the war. Now the M1 carbine would stay in service until about the early 70s, and in fact was issued in Vietnam to US and mainly Arvin troops as well, uh, under the control of you know different elements of the US Armed Forces uh, as we provided the Arvin with you know Thompsons and M1 carbines and M1 Garands and BARs, mainly old ordnance, as everything was being replaced with M14s and M16s. But anyway, we ended up with this uh, carbine and it is a really, really fun carbine to shoot. It is chambered in, in 30 carbine, short stroke gas piston, as, as uh, mentioned, about five to six pounds and a really, really cool carbine. Now, one other ingenious thing about this is war ingenuity at the time in the United States. So the M1 carbine was made by a lot of different manufacturers. Rockola Jukebox, Underwood, Saginaw, Inland, General Motors, uh, Winchester. In fact, Winchester was actually the only arms designer of all the manufacturers that actually manufactured M1 carbines. Everybody else had been retooled for a wartime economy to produce this carbine. So you'll see these, uh, 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 made by a lot of different manufacturers and all the parts uh, are interchangeable. In fact, you routinely see these with a conglomeration of different parts from different manufacturers, which is actually correct in most cases. Uh, anyway, really, really cool carbine. Now what this is, is this is an auto ordinance. Now auto ordinance did not actually manufacture these during World War II. Uh, you had companies like Ivor Johnson, Auto Ordnance, uh, Universal, who would take uh, surplus GI parts and build M1 carbines. And that was commonly seen around the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they would be marketed to civilian and, and police uh, forces, but were not inherently known as military firearms. Now, Auto Ordnance Company, which was famed for the production of the Thompsons, especially during World War, uh, uh, World War II, the M1 and the M1A1 Thompson would actually later in 1999 be sold to Car Arms, who makes these and semi-automatic Thompsons today under the same brand, Auto Ordnance. Uh, but not really, it's kind of a, a shell of what it, its former self was. It's, it's been reincorporated a couple times. But uh, anyway, this is a slightly older one and probably made around the 90s uh, prior to the uh, purchase from Car Arms. Uh, but today you can get the manufactured brand new. And new, you know, they're typically would retail about eight or $900. Uh, but the pricing on all of these is up right now. Uh, even used, I'm seeing them between about $900 and $1,300 in some cases, depending on condition, what it comes with and stuff like that. So anyway, I've always been a fan of the M1 carbine. Uh, this is not an auto ordinance, post-war commercial M1 carbine. Still really cool nonetheless, and a lot of fun to shoot if you ever get a chance to pick one up. All right, up next I have somewhat of a coincidental firearm. If you guys remember two weeks ago in my weekly used gun review on episode number 40, I had a modern PC carbine. And on that uh, sort of description of that firearm, I had alluded to this, the original PC carbine, or the Police Carbine 9, as it was introduced in 1996. So coincidentally, here I have one for you to sort of show you the whole picture. Uh, the Police Carbine 9, also offered in 40, which this is, again, was introduced in 1996 and was manufactured until about 2006, when it would be discontinued for about a decade. Now, the whole concept or philosophy behind the PC Carbine when it first came out in the 90s is, remember, 
Uh, in the late 80s, a lot of the police departments were thinking about getting away from what was traditionally carried, which is full-size steel-framed either revolvers like a Smith & Wesson Model 10 or the Smith & Wesson 5903-5906 series uh, pistols. So, of course, in the late 80s, Glock's coming in and it's starting to make a splash and polymer frame is starting to become all the thing. And then the uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Ruger would come out with the Model 95, which is a polymer frame pistol. Now, a year later, they would come out with this concept, the police carbine, and it was named as such because it was intended to be marketed to police alongside the Model 95 or other 90 uh, Model 90 series pistols, which use this magazine. So it could be sold to police departments as a, as a standard issue sidearm. And this would be your squad car patrol rifle. And the advantage would be that you would be able to share your magazines between your pistol and your, your rifle. Or if your partner has the, the rifle and you have the pistol, you can share mags if you're running out of ammunition. Uh, anything along those lines. Now the concept of a pistol and a carbine that use the same ammunition is actually not a new concept. And this was a very popular uh, concept around the days of the Old West, you know, the early era, the mid to late 1850s when you had your six shooter chambered in the same caliber as your long gun would be at like a 32 20 1873 with your 32 20 colt single action army that was a similar philosophy but really meant for the 1990s now unfortunately much to ruger's chagrin this was not really well received by police departments or the commercial market alike and again in 2006 these would fall out of production if you look at what this is compared to the modern Ruger PC carbine, this is really just a scaled up 1022. They literally took the same philosophy of the 1022 and beefed it up by about 10%, uh, allowing it to chamber a pistol round. Okay, it, and there's a little bit more there to it as well, straight blowback design. Not much else to say about it. It's It has a lot of similar features in the sight configuration and barrel configuration to things like the Mini 14. So a nice little uh, kind of conglomeration of different Ruger products. Now, in 2014, 2015, you guys all know that the PCC, the pistol caliber carbine market was beginning to really take off of things like the Scorpion, the High, uh, the high Point uh, carbines, which had actually been out since the 90s as well. Um, and so Ruger decided to revamp the line on the newer takedown model PC carbine, now standing for a pistol caliber carbine, or a pistol carbine and uh or yeah pistol caliber carbine and is now uh seeing wide success so that's just a difference in how the market existed in the 1990s as compared to today uh but anyway just kind of a cool distinct uh, period in history and a lot of people actually don't know about these original pc carbines they hear ruger pc carbine and immediately assume the modern variation a lot of people think you know, the, the PC carbine was the first variation of its type. It actually all started right here. So cool to actually get that in a couple weeks after talking about it when discussing the modern PC carbine. So go back and take a look at episode 40 if you want to see uh, the modern PC carbine and how it might compare to something like this. Now, if we're talking about price point, of course, 40s like this are not going to sell as well as 9 millimeters. Uh, but even now, and this one is in good condition. There's some finish wear up here on the barrel and you know, some handling marks on the stock, no box, it does have two magazines. Something like this might be in about the five to $600 price point, maybe six to seven, you know, I'd say five to 700, just to be fair. Um, they are not very common, but of course with the more modern PC carbines, if somebody's looking for something more practical for the same price, they're probably gonna skew towards the, the new release variation, the takedown model. Uh, somebody who's more of a classic Ruger collector who likes the old original variations of these things, again, more of the collector's market is going to gravitate towards this. So depending on what type of buyer you are, kind of would dictate which one you find more appealing to purchase. So there you go, the Ruger Police Carbine 40. Okay, up next is a pretty unique little rifle. This is a Chiapa Little Badger survival rifle. I'll get this out of here for you got this cool pouch that it'll actually fit into. So the little badger, as you can see, is a folding survival rifle. These were chambered in 22 long rifle, 22 Magnum, uh, 17 WSM, and 17 HMR. Now, the primary version of this that most people are familiar with are the skeletonized stock version, where it's basically just a long triangular type wire stock here in the back. With the barrel, it's got you know uh, some Picatinny rail sections up here and some shell holders. 
which the traditional model does come in at a weight of under three pounds. So it's actually a very, very lightweight and very handy rifle. Now this is the deluxe version where they've replaced the skeletonized furniture with actual wood stock and four end set. And this does increase the weight by about half a pound. So you're looking at about the three and a half pound range on something like this. Now it is a single shot top break. And this one's, of course, uh, this one is a 22 long rifle. Where you just open it up, you pop in a single round, close it. You have to bring the hammer back and then you fire. To break the hinge, there is a secondary little trigger actuator right here at the front of the trigger guard. You pull and you break it down. Now there is a recess spot in the hand guard so it can fold right into the trigger guard, giving you actually a very, very lightweight and very handy package. Again, this with the wood stocks is only at about three and a half pounds. It's so great for backpacking, hiking, if you just want to keep it you know, under the, the back seat of your truck. Uh, just, just a good little handy survival gun. Now, Chiapa has been around. It was founded as Army Sport in Italy uh, in about the 1950s, about 19, early, or early 1950s, 55, 56, somewhere around in there. Uh, they do have American-based manufacturing right now, and they do make popular firearms such as the Chiapa Rhino, the very uh, weird, iconic revolver that fires at the six o'clock position. They're also known for making, uh, you know, cowboy action style firearms like Spencer rifles, uh, double barrel shotguns, uh, single action army clones and things of that nature. But they also make, of course, a variety of different innovative designs like this, the Little Badger. Price point wise, the skeletonized stock version MSRP is at about the 230 range, but right now I'm seeing them used in good condition at about 250. Um, these MSRP at about 280, 290. Um, I have not seen any of these sold on the used market lately, but I would assume that based on the wire stock versions going for about the 250 range, that these would probably go for about 250 to $300 right now in good condition in the original box like this. Um, but you know, who knows? Uh, it's a threaded barrel, a 16 and a half inch. You have a section of rail right here and it does use an M1 carbine style, the, the later variation M1 carbine rear sight. So just a cool little handy package. So not something that I typically get into often. Uh, happy, I, I actually a very, very good customer and a friend of mine did uh, sell this to me. So really cool to get this and to be able to share it on the video. So anyway, there's that. The Chiapa Little Badger and this again is the deluxe version with the Woodstock set. Okay, up next I have a very popular pistol to a lot of collectors. This is a Browning High Power. This one here chambered in nine millimeter which feeds from a 13 round detachable back, uh, double stack box magazine and a single action only. It does have a magazine disconnect. Beautiful factory blued finish. This does not have the original grips. These are Packmeyer grips. Original grips would be a wood, you know, slab side panel with a little bit of checkering in it. This has factory adjustable rear sight. Uh, this particular model was made in 1987. Now the story here would actually begin in about 1915, 1916, when France would put out a request for applicants to a new handgun for their military. Uh, FN wanted to participate in these trials, so they did commission the help of John Moses Browning to come up with a design which would meet the requirements of the French new service sidearm, which they wanted to have a nine millimeter as well as a capacity of over 10 rounds. And there were a certain size and weight requirements that they wanted to meet as well. Now, working within those parameters, John Moses Browning would get to work. Now, the problem was, is he had already designed uh, the 1911 pistol, which he sold the rights to to Colt. And so, as now working for a separate arms manufacturer, FN in Belgium, uh, John Browning had to try and come up with design concepts for this pistol, which would not be too closely related to the 1911. So he had to skirt around those patents when designing this. Now, unfortunately, in 1926, while in the middle of development of this, John Moses Browning would die. And due to a save of FN would take up production on the high power. So John Browning actually never saw the pistol come to full end of production. Now also a little bit after that in 1928, the patent rights to the 1911 from Colt would run out. So due to a save would be able to incorporate some of John Browning's famous 1911 design implements into this firearm, uh, which he did. So a lot of people equate it to a more modernized a double stack 1911, and it definitely shares a lot of similar design elements to that pistol. So a nice culmination work between two firearms geniuses, Diodene Save of FN, who would go on to create things like the FN 49 and the FN FAL, and John Moses Browning, which of course, I mean, everybody knows the uh, arms development genius of Browning with the 1917 and 1919 machine guns, the BAR, the 1911, just a, a, a tremendous amount of work that he did, the 1886 Winchester. So. 
really, really cool lineage, and it all sort of ended there with the high power, kind of the final, uh, you know, brainchild of John Browning, taken to the finish line by uh, DNA save of, of FN. Um, some of the interesting things about this pistol is it was actually, uh, probably does stand to be one of the most widely issued service sidearms from any country uh, in the world in history, uh, still being issued today with a lot of military and police's, uh, police forces around the world. Um, most notably, some of the most common uh, military service that the uh, high power would see is in World War II, uh, you had Canada, which would uh, use the Inglis, which was a variation of the high power. You had Germany, which after the capture of Belgium would push a lot of the FN, uh, high powers into service is the P-35, and you can find these with the different Waffen Amps German markings on them, and those, you know, do have quite a bit of value to them. Early variations would have a tangent rear sight, much like a rifle, so an elevated uh, slider, which would change your elevation, and a slot in the back of the pistol grip, which you could attach a shoulder stock to, so those early variations are, are very uh, popular. Now, if we look at the price point, the price point on high powers, because they were made over such a long period of time in different configurations, they do uh, vary widely. Uh, if you're looking at a German marked World War II with a tangent sight and with a shoulder stock, you could be in thousands of dollars. Uh, if you're looking at a base model from the 1970s with standard sights, uh, you know, you might be looking at about 700 to 1,000. This particular one with the factory adjustable sights I'm seeing sell right now used for about 1,000 to 1,100 dollars. The Capitans with the tangent sights, uh, more modern production, those are going higher, maybe about 1,500. So they, I mean, they really do run the gambit of pricing. Uh, you're typically going to start off, you're probably not going to get much lower than about six to 700 dollars for a genuine, you know, FN marked Belgian made high power, depending on condition, but the pricing can really go as high as four or five thousand dollars for some examples of different vintages and eras and war procurements, uh, you know, in that regard. So it depends on the collector and what they're looking for. All right, last but not least, I have a couple pistols that are really pretty much hen's teeth, and I didn't think I would ever really have one in here, uh, especially let alone a pair of them. Uh, these are Sphinx 2000 series pistols. This is the AT. 2000H in 9mm, and this is the AT2000P, if I can get it out of here, in 40. Uh, let me get the boxes out of the way and I'll bring back the handguns. Okay, so in about the mid 80s, a company called ITM would come out with a revised and refined variation of the CZ-75, really a licensed copy of the CZ-75. Now the CZ-75 is a pistol that everybody knows and loves, or most people love <laughs> today, which came out in the current Czech Republic in about 1975, as the name would suggest. Even though Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic did not really use the CC-75 for a number of years, it did garner a lot of interest with police and military forces around the world, as well as specifically uh, shooting enthusiast markets within the Czech Republic here in the United States and other European countries as well. Now, this was of course derived in Switzerland and like typical Swiss nature, it's let's take something and make it as precisely fine-tuned as possible. And Swiss arms in general are really known for their high quality. Um, so in about the 1980s, they decided it was, uh, ITM decided that they were going to make a revived and even better improved variation of an already very popular and successful pistol, the CZ-75. Well, a couple years later, after they're you know getting into development, a company called Sphinx would buy ITM, and then they would rebrand the name as Sphinx. Uh, basically, the 2000 series. It was originally known as the ITM 200, and then after Sphinx would purchase it, it was the AT 2000. Now, there were basically three main models of the AT 2000. There was the S, which was the standard model, which was the largest of the three, bigger than this one kind of like a Glock 17, a Glock 19, and a Glock 26. So the S is the full size, you know, wear it outside the waistband, full size surface pistol. The P for police would be the midsize, kind of like the Glock 19, uh, for really intended for police service use. And then the H or the hideaway version would be the concealed carry version, kind of like the Glock 26, if you will, okay? Mechanically, they're identical, except for just the size. There is also a DA or double action variation. All the standard models are single action only. Uh, so the DA model you can get in either size, the S, the H, or the P, DA. And that was essentially it. I think there was one other variation as well as one of the double action variants as well, but those are the primary ones that, that would be manufactured. Now they would really start up in scale production in 1990 and would end production 
around the 2000s, 2001, 2002, so they had about 10 to 12 years of production and they would be replaced by the 3000 series. Now there is currently a Sphinx pistol, which is a polymer frame, which is not related to these, and those are, you know, five, six hundred dollars. Um, these were not made and not really purchased in any large number. There were some select police forces that did use them, but because they are a heavier weight and the price on them is exorbitant, very expensive to manufacture, um, they did not really gain a whole lot of, uh, of use by a lot of people, which has led to a lot of their rarity today. Um, if we look at the design, of course, it is, as you can tell, very, very heavily influenced by the CZ-75, but the design has changed enough to where you could somewhat consider it its own sort of uh, self-iteration, if you will. Uh, the tolerances are super tight. The machining is just excellent. I mean, this, these things feel and fit and look like a piece of art. Uh, the trigger on them is wonderful as well. Very, very light single action pull with a even better reset. Really, really smooth. The, this is the nine, the 40. Same trigger. I think the reset on this is even better. right there. So really, really nice refined pistols. Now price point on these. Um, typically uh, these things have gone up and up and up over the years, but typically right now you're finding them in the $2,000 price point uh, respectively. Now the nine millimeters are going to go for more money. That's just how, the way it is in, in all uh, pistol lineups, but even the 40s are in and of themselves pretty uncommon that they still command a pretty good amount of money. Um, a thousand, uh, thousand to two thousand on the uh, forty, and then you're probably looking at about uh, two thousand uh, up, you know, on the nine millimeter. So uh, it, it's really hard to pinpoint pricing on these things because there just are not very many of them that are bought and sold. But there's also not that big of a collector's market on them because not a lot of people know about their existence. But anyway, a really, really good if you're looking for something as a collectible, or you're looking for something as a refined. Maybe you're a CZ75 fan and you want like the ultimate refined variation of that pistol. These Sphinx AT2000 series pistols are just really, really cool. Again, I never thought I would ever have one in here, let alone a pair of them. Uh, these are going to be tough to let go, but such is the nature of running a gun store. But really, really cool pistols, and I'm glad I had them on this video to share with you. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. We do post these videos every week. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.